Hello everyone. Welcome to your introduction to Excel for LGLA 2333. To launch Excel, we're going to go to our menu, the start menu, and on my computer, we would just click on Excel. Another way we could launch Excel would be to find it in the taskbar, which is down here. We could launch it by clicking here. We're going to click on Start and Excel. Wait for that to load, and we will start with a blank workbook. So today we will uh, work on just, we're going to maximize this. Remember that this is your minimize button. That would make it minimized and down in the system tray. The maximize button will make it show full screen and of course the X would close the program. This will be a review for those of you who use Windows programs already. We start out with the menu bar, then we have a toolbar here. Remember that as you choose different tabs on the menu bar, the toolbar does change. I'm going to go back to the home menu and then we have, in Excel, we have the function entry, the formula bar right here. And <clears throat> as you key things in the cells in, ex in Excel, your, it will show up in the formula bar. Just to go over some definitions that you will need, let's start off with a worksheet. When you first open book one in Excel, if you look at the bottom where my cursor is, you have the sheet one tab. That means this is a worksheet. If I file the, if I click on file and save this file, we now have a workbook. Most workbooks, however, have more than one worksheet. For instance, <clears throat> excuse me, let's say that I need to add some different sheets to this uh, workbook. If I click on sheet one, that's my first worksheet. I can double click on the name down here on the tab. I could name it, um, let's see, I'll name it with one of my uh, program names. Let's do Paralegal Studies, PLS. I could click on the next one and I could name it ADMN for Administrative Assistant. The next one, ACNT for Accounting Technology and so forth. If I needed to get rid of a worksheet, I would just select it by clicking on it, right click, and then I could either delete it, rename it, or move or copy it. In this case, I want to delete it. So I'll delete that sheet and I'll delete this sheet. Now, I'm just doing this to illustrate that I might have a related group of worksheets in a workbook. So if I did a file, save as, and let's, I'm just going to save this on the, um, on the desktop for today. I might name this uh, ACT for Administrative Computer Technology Programs, Budgets. So I could have a budget for each of my programs saved in one workbook called ACT Budgets. Okay, so the file name is going to appear up here once I name it. So this would be a workbook. Each of these would be a worksheet. Now I'm going to close that by Xing out of the program. I'm going to launch Excel again and continue with a, a new worksheet. Notice that we don't have all of the worksheets anymore. We're starting over. And at this point, I'm going to go over the definitions that you need to, to have to follow along with this demonstration. Once we start building the worksheet, I will want you to watch the video on one device and complete the Excel worksheet with me on your computer. So back to definitions. A worksheet is made up of columns and rows. I'm illustrating what a row is right here. The intersection of a column and a row is known as a cell. So I could click anywhere on this Excel spreadsheet worksheet and spreadsheet, they're, changed inter they're used interchangeably, and that would be a cell. 
the intersection of a, a column and a row is a cell, and the cell address or cell name is the letter of the column followed by the number of the row. So right now I'm in cell F10. What is the name of the cell that I'm in now? C8. So the intersection of C8. So that's how we do our cell addressing. We could also click, hold, and drag our cursor, and you can do that on your screen, and then you've selected what we call a range of cells. A range of cells is named by taking the cell at, the, uh, at one corner, so this would be C5, through, we go diagonally across, so diagonally is this way, to G13. So this cell would be C5 through G13. This is how we would key that, C5, and then we would use the colon, shift, and the two dots, the colon, through G13. So this is how we would address that range of cells. So I'm going to reselect it now. So I need C5 through G13. And that would be this range of cells, C5 through G13. So that's how you name a range of cells. Let's see, we've done workbook, worksheet, columns, rows, and a cell and a range of cells. Next, let's go into um, the different cursors that you're going to use for Excel. Excel is all about the cursors. If you learn the different shapes of the cursors and what they do, you'll be way ahead in being able to work with Excel. Now, at this point, I want you to launch Excel on your computer and do this assignment with me as I complete a worksheet and talk about the different, uh, different cell cursors and the different formulas and how you enter text, numbers, etc. So I'm going to pause just for a moment and give you a chance to go into Excel and then we'll continue. Okay, so we're going to be completing a personal budget worksheet. And um, we're just going to go through and, and complete the worksheet, and then we're going to come back and do some formatting on it once we get the worksheet complete. So I'm going to have you click an insertion point in cell A1. So we just click, this is the selection cursor, the, the large uh, plus symbol that is hollow or, or blank inside is called the selection cursor. So we just click one time in cell A1, and we can just start typing. And so we're going to type personal, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to capitalize it, put it in all caps, budget worksheet. Notice that the text spills over into columns B, C, and D a little bit. That's OK. That's what text is going to do. Then in cell A2, I'm going to key monthly estimates. And so you'll do the same on your worksheet. Once we have that in, we're, we're ready to do some more labels. So I'm going to go down to row 4 so that I have a little bit of space in between. And I'm going to enter all of my labels. So starting in cell A4, I'm going to enter income, and then I'm just going to tab to move across. And we're going to need income for, this will be a six-month period, let's say. So if I need my income for a six-month period, watch what I can do to enter the months in Excel. So I'm going to enter January, and then I'm just going, and I'm going to press enter, and then I'm just going to stop. I'm going to go back up to January, and I, the next cursor that you need to learn is called the fill cursor. Notice that a cell 
has a little square at the bottom right hand corner of it. Can you see the little square at the bottom right hand corner? If you put your cursor right over that, you are using the what's called the fill handle. So with the skinny plus sign, which is the fill handle, we're going to click, hold, and drag. And as we drag, if we watch the screen, we will see the months pop up on the screen. And we want to go through June. So we let go, and Excel fills in the months for us. So the Excel can do several different types of series fills. Uh, computers are great counters. It can do the series fills for months, for days of week. You can make it skip count. Many different things you can do with the fill handle. So we have our months, month labels in all the way January, February, March, April, May, June. In column H, we're going to put a title for the total. Okay, so then we're going to come over in cell A5, click an insertion point in A5, and we're going to put in some more labels. So under income, we're going to need we're going to need wages, and we're going to you need dividends. So we'll key both of those in, and then we will need total. And then we are going to go down to row nine and put in expenses. And by expenses, again, for our expenses, we're going to need all of those months. So again, we can type in January and press enter, click on that cell, get our fill handle by moving the cursor over that little square at the bottom right hand corner, we click, hold, and drag until we get to June. And then again, we're going to need total. And we can either click or we can cursor to move back to the next cell that we need, which would be cell A10. In cell A10, we will begin entering the different categories of our expenses. So we're going to put in rent, food, tuition, books, entertainment, car payment, gas, and miscellaneous. Then total. Then we're going to go down to cell A20 to put net. So we have our all of our text labels entered into the spreadsheet at this time. So at this time, we're going to do go ahead and do a file, save as. You can navigate to wherever you're going to save your files. I'm going to save mine on the desktop for this demonstration. And I'm just going to call this Demo Excel. Okay, so we had a little bit of a break there. Uh, we'll resume with uh, talking about our labels that we've just entered. We've just entered our labels for our worksheet. And at this point, I would have you pause and make sure that your labels are entered because the next thing we will do is enter our values and then we'll get into how we do formulas and functions in Excel. So if you would pause the video and make sure you have all of your labels entered like mine, then we'll come back and we'll do some formatting and do some more data entry and get into our formulas. Okay, so we're ready to fill in our spreadsheet and it's going to be a little bit easier to work with this spreadsheet if we do a little bit of formatting. We will notice, you'll notice that in column A, our labels kind of hang over into the other columns. Here is a quick and easy way to format that to make room for all of the labels. We're going to go up to, um, 
first of all, to format the title. So we're going to, to format the title, we are going to use the merge and center command. There are a couple of steps involved in using that command. Well, for one thing, we want to look at this and we know that we used all the way through column H on this worksheet. So with our selection cursor, we're going to click in A1. We're going to click, hold, and drag. We're going to select all the way to H. And that's telling Excel that we want this title centered over columns A through H. So then we come up to make sure we're on the Home tab and over to the Merge and Center command. So we click on that and look, our cells are merged and our title is centered. We'll do the same thing with the subtitle. So we'll click in cell A2 and then with the selection cursor, we will click, hold down the mouse button and drag over to column H. That tells Excel these are the cells we want it centered in, and then we hit the Merge and Center button. So we have our title centered now. Now we're going to work with the titles going through column A. Some of these do extend, as we said earlier, over into other columns. We're going to come up to the line right between column A and B. See this little line between A and B? Here's another new cursor. This is the double-headed arrow. We will see it when we position our cursor directly over that line between column A and column B. With the double-headed arrow displayed as it is, see, we move, it changes the cursor. As it is, we click, hold, and we could either drag this out to see that it gives us this visible line that we could see how wide we're making the column. We could click, hold, and drag so that we all of these appear in column A, or here's a second way to do it. Again, we get the double-headed arrow and we just click twice quickly. It's called a double click, double click, and it's automatically going to make this column the, the correct size. So what you can do also we can tell by looking that column A is a little bit wider than the other columns, but these columns, B through H, are similar in size. Um, what we can do is use our column selector icon. Notice that if I hold my cursor over column B, I have a thick downward pointing black arrow. I could select column B. Well, I really want to select column B through H. So what I'm going to do is click, hold, and drag all the way over to H. And then, because I want all of these column widths to adjust at the same time, I'm going to double click on column H so that I can see what it would do to make all of these what we call auto fit. Okay, I'm looking at this. I don't really like the way that looks for auto fit. So with all of those still selected, and I'm going to unselect to show you how I selected them again. I'm going to click on, I'm going to get the downward pointing arrow over column B, click, and then I'm going to click, hold, and drag all the way through column H. I, th I know that because of the numbers that we're going to be entering here, that these columns need to be a little wider. So if I want to adjust all of those column widths at one time, I select the columns like we just have. I come over to the border at column H, get my double-headed arrow, I click, hold, and drag, and you'll see the tool tip as I drag. It's changing to 8.29, 8.79. 9, I don't really know how wide I need these, so I'm just going to estimate, and I'm going to make this column width at about, oh, let's make it at around 12 something. Doesn't matter what the fraction is. That you're, you're just getting practice doing column widths right now. So around 12 would be a good column width for that. So now our spreadsheet is at least spaced out so that we can work with it a little bit better. 
Now, we could go in and uh, for January through February, uh, excuse me, January through total on row four, we could click in B4 and then click hold and drag. Okay, that's selected. We're going to format this. However, we also have a title, uh, a, a row of uh, titles down here that we need to format. So if you need to add to a selection in Excel, you can click, you can hold down the control key on the keypad. So on the on your keyboard, you're holding down the control key. You click on January and you drag through total. So now you have January through total selected on row four and on row nine. And I'm just going to come up to my alignment group and go to my center icon and click so that now those titles are going to be centered over the values that we enter next. At any time during this video, you need to see a, a function again. You know that you can use the pause and you can uh, scrub the cursor, scrub back on the video so that you can see it all again. So next we're going to enter our data, our numeric data for January. We're going to double click in cell B5 and we're going to put our amount in for January. We don't put any commas but we do our decimal points. So we're going to do 1,000 and 29 cents. We have thousand dollars and 29 cents. We don't need dollar signs. We don't need any type of uh, other symbols other than just that 1,000.29 like I put it in there. Now, let's say that that's what we make every month. That's the amount we make every month. We could go and click in each one of these and fill in 1,000. Dot 29, but instead, uh, we know how to use our fill cursor. Again, we're going to put the cursor right over that little square in the bottom right hand corner of the cell, get the skinny plus symbol, click, hold, and drag. And we want to drag it all the way through June because we want to leave the total blank. So when we do that, it just copies that 1029, it fills those cells with $1,000.29. Okay, let's say that we have an investment and that it gets paid dividends in January and in June. In January, let's say that we earned $4,000.75. And then we're going to cursor over to June, which is in June dividends would be G6. So we click an insertion point there double click and we're going to put in our June dividends for 3009.25 and enter that and you can tell I made a typo there so I have to re-enter that. So here's a good way to correct that. I don't even have to erase it. I can just click on it and put the money the the amount in again 3009.25 and press enter and it's corrected. Okay, we're going to leave our totals blank for now because we want to fill in all of our rent values and our expense values. So we're going to click an insertion point in B10 and we're going to put in our rent 400.89. We probably share at that amount, we probably share an apartment with one or two people. And that rent doesn't change. It's the same every month. So we can come, we can click, we, we enter so that the amount is there, $400.89. And then we're going to come back and use our fill handle to fill all the way through June. When you use the fill handle, make sure that it does what you want it to. We wanted it to put $400.89 in January through June. Then for food, remember this is a budget. We don't know exactly how much we're going to spend on food, but we're just trying to budget our money with this. We're going to allow ourselves $300 for our food budget. So we're going to put the 300 in, use the fill handle and fill that across to June. Tuition is charged $1,500, let us say in uh, January, you just paid tuition. And then we didn't have any tuition in February through June. So we'll just leave our tuition at 1500 
Books were going to allow 500 in January. And again, for books, we're not going to have any two-ish, any book fees for January through, um, for, excuse me, for February through June. So we just leave the $500. The monthly entertainment budget is going to be 100 Remember, this is a budget. We're going to fill that all the way through June. Our car payment is $154.79. We'll put that in, enter it, click on it, use the fill handle because it doesn't change throughout the months. We're going to allow $100 for gas. We must have a car that is very economical. So we've allowed $100 for gas, and then we're going to allow $100 a month for miscellaneous expenses. So again, we're going to use the fill handle to fill that in. So you see that using the fill handle will save you a lot of time for filling in um, amounts that are the same or series things such as months, days of week, and other numbers. Okay, so the rest of the spreadsheet is going to be calculated. And this is where you really get into the use of Excel. Excel is used mainly for financial statements, budgets, uh, any type of calculations that you need to do because it will do all your calculation for you. You just have to know the format of either the function or the formula that you want to use. Now I'm going to uh, talk about functions and formulas next. And I'm going to illustrate the difference between them. Excel has several different what we call functions built in. And they are mathematical calculations that are used over and over and over again. So we're going the first place we need a function or a formula is in cell H5. So click an insertion point in H5. And then we're going to look on the Home tab all, almost all the way to the right. And you're going to find a drop down uh, with a little epsilon symbol. And these are functions in Excel. Sum, average, count numbers, max, min, and then there are more. The one we need right now is our sum function because we just need to know what the sum of our wages would be for January through June. So we click on the sum and Excel puts in the formula for us or the function for that. All formulas in Excel begin with the equal key. So Excel has keyed in for us equal sum and then the parentheses B5 through G5. That is what we want it to, <clears throat> excuse me, have some water. Okay, that is what we want it to add. We want it to add the values that are in cells B5 plus C5 plus D5 plus E5 plus F5 plus G5. The quick way to do that, rather than typing in that long formula, is to use the sum function function. So it's equal sum, open parenthesis, and then you give the range name, B5 through G5. That is correct, so we're going to press enter. <clears throat> and that should return a sum of 6,074 cents. Now, this is really going to be uh, the cool a cool uh, time saver for you. We've done that sum function. I'm going to do it one more time. Uh, I'm going to click in H10, and I'm going to show you how to use the sum function one more time. Again, you select the starting place for your function. You come up to Auto Sum. You click on Sum. You double check where the marching ants are. Um, Excel is a very visual tool. It's showing you the, the range of cells that it is going to sum. And it also shows you the keyed in function or formula, the equal sum, open parentheses, B10 through G10, and we press enter. Okay, well, that's cool. 
But what's even faster, the uh, faster time saver, is that once you have a formula in, you know, computers are great counters. And Excel can adjust your formula for you as you copy it down or across a group of cells. In this case, we're going to copy the formula, which is in H5, so we have to click an insertion point, just not, uh, not an insertion point, but just a selection, excuse me, in H5. So that's the cell that we have selected. We come over to the fill handle, and we're going to copy that formula down through rows six and seven, and then we'll just let go. Now, you've got a return of zero in row seven because we haven't done the totals over here yet. We'll get to that. But I do want you to look at the formula that you ha have in cell H6. Excel knew that when it copied the formula from row five to row six, that it just needed to automatically change the row number for you. And it did that. I'm going to click in H5. Notice that it was summing B5 through G5. But when we're on row six, we want it to sum B6 through G6. Did it do that? Well, yes, it did. And it knew to do that just because you moved the cursor down by one row. So it adjusted your formula automatically for you. Okay, let's click in cell B7 and start filling in some of these other formulas. Now, I'm going to do a different formula on B7. Yes, we could use the sum function, but I want you to uh, have to construct a formula piece by piece. So for this particular formula, we're going to type the equals key. The equals key is to the left of the backspace key on your keyboard. We're going to do equals, and we need to add for January to get our total income. We need to add whatever is in B5 plus B6. So we can actually just key that in, B5, and then the plus B6. And we could press enter, and it's going to do the formula. Remember, all formulas start with an equal sign. So we would press enter. That should give us $5,001.04. Now, we want, to add every, we want to add February, March, April, May, and June. We have the total for each one of those months that we need to know how much we made in each month. We've put in our formula in cell B7, which is equals B5 through B6. Again, we can use that fill handle. And since we're moving to the right with the fill handle, Excel is going to know to adjust our formula by changing only the column label. So we're going to fill it. We should get... Uh, these values, double check yours and make sure that you got the same values. And then we're going to go back and we're going to look at the formulas that Excel automatically put in there. In column C, it put in C5 plus C6. That is correct, five, C5 and C6. This, this for column D, it should be D5 through D6, and of course it is. Now, I'm looking at the formula when I click on the value for March, which is in cell D7. My cursor is in D7, and the spreadsheet is showing me the value returned by the formula. The value is $1,000.29. If I want to see the formula, Remember that I can look right up here on the formula bar, which is right here where my uh, cursor is sweeping to show you right now. That's called the formula bar. So what is actually in that cell is this formula, but it's returning the value for us. This one should be, it's column E, so it should be E5 through E6. 
F should be F5 through F6, and so forth. So we see that when we did our fill handle, uh, Excel did adjust our formulas correctly for us. So we will use that technique. We're going to use the sum function to fill in the rest of our totals. And so we're going to go next to cell B18. So click an insertion point in cell B18. This time we'll use the sum function because we do want the total. And we do need to have in mind when we use these functions or formulas, we need to kind of formulate in our mind before we do the for formula exactly what we want done. So what we want done on this one is that we want the value in B10 plus all the values all the way through B17. We want all of those added. So our function should say, once we do it, equals sum B10 through B17. Now, let's do that. We're going to go up to our sum function, click on the auto sum button, and, and double check it. Did it add B10 through B17? Yes, it did. If you're a visual learner, you can see that it selected the correct amount, the correct number of cells above it. It does not always select what you want it to select, so you have to check it. So we're going to press enter. Well, we know that that same formula can be copied all the way through June, and actually it could be copied all the way through the total, which we haven't filled in here yet. So we're going to use the fill handle and copy that across. And then we are going to go back to this formula because we haven't totaled our food, tuition, books, entertainment, all of these yet. But we do need the same formula that was used up here. And we just want it to adjust by one row at a time, don't we? So we want it to adjust to row 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And we've seen from the way Excel functions before that it will do that for us. So we're going to get the fill handle. We're going to click, hold, and drag to fill that formula down through H17. So at this point, I'm going to stop. Have you check your values. Now, what happens if you got a different value returned on one of your formulas? There are two things you would do. You would check your formula to make sure it's right. And I'm going to display the formulas for you in just a few minutes. But you would also just proofread your data to make sure your data was entered correctly. Remember, you can pause the video at any time and just look at your data and double check it and um, make sure that you have your data correct. At this time, we're going to go ahead and finish this budget spreadsheet, and then we'll talk a little bit about the decisions that we could make based on the values that we find in our spreadsheet. So what we need to know, you know, we're, we're doing this so that we, for planning purposes, we're doing a budget worksheet for planning purposes. So we need to know how we did. How did we do in January? How did we do in February? Did we, did we have enough money? How did we do in March? And so forth. So to do that, we're going to calculate what our net, uh, our net was. And so for our net, what we would do is we would take our income minus our expenses. So for January, where's our net? Where's our total income for, Janu for January? Well, our total income, here's our income, here's total, here's January. That's going to be in B7. So we're going to need a formula that will take the total income minus the total expenses for January. Well, our total income is in B7. Our total expenses for January is in B18. So our formula is going to need to take whatever is in B7 minus B18. So the first step in entering a formula is to click the cell where you want to enter the formula. 
now that you've entered, you've figured out what the formula needs to be. So we're going to click an insert, click uh, the cell B20 because that's where our net is going to be. And then when we get ready to enter it, what is the first key we put in for a formula? If you said the equal sign, you are correct. The equal sign, once again, is to the left of the backspace key. Notice that we don't need the word sum. We're not doing a sum. Sum is addition. We need to subtract. So we're just using cell references to do our subtraction. Now before, I had you type the equal sign and then key in the cell references, but you also can use the pointing method. We already decided that we need to subtract the value that is in B7. So I'm going to click one time on B7. When I do that, notice that Excel starts to build the formula for me. We, so far we have equals B7. We said we needed to subtract what's in B18, so we have to hit the subtraction symbol, the minus, and then we click on B18, and that's the formula we need, isn't it? Total January income minus total January expenses. So we press enter, and in January we did okay, didn't we? We had, if we lived within our budget, we would have $1,000, $845, <clears throat> excuse me, and 36 cents left over. Okay, so once again, that formula equals B7 minus B18. It can be copied across, right? We have contiguous cells going across where we need to figure out the very same thing. So again, we're going to get our fill handle. We're going to click, hold, and drag, and drag that through June. And we're going to stop at that point. Well, I guess, you know what? Go ahead and fill it all the way through total. We can do that. And then we need to talk a little bit about the amounts that we see there. Okay, so it looks like in January we did okay. But in February, we were short $155. March, we were short. April and May, we were short. And in June, we got that dividend, so we did okay again in June. Overall, for the half of the year, we were fine. We, we ended up with enough, enough money for the whole year. But what this tells us as a planning tool is that in January, we're going to have to save enough money to get us through February, March, April, and May. At this point, I want to show you a neat little tool that Excel has that you can look at, at different values while you're making, while you're doing your plan. So we've already determined that we're short in February unless we've saved some of this money from January, right? And we've already determined that we're short. We've got a minus. Uh, we ran out of money in February. Or with this budget, we will run out of money in February, March, April, and May. Look what we can do. Look at our net for February. We're going to select the net for February, March, April, and May. If we stay on this budget, we can select those cells and look down here at the status line and it's going to give us the average. It's going to count. It's also going to give us the sum. Excel added those four amounts that were short, telling us that by staying on this budget, we're going to be short $620.56. Oh, okay. Well, that's not too bad because we had $1845.36 left in January. So we need to put, this tells us that we need to put at least this much out of that 1845.36 into savings to cover us for February through May. We really need to put more than that because you may have a car repair or you may have something break and you're, um, that you have to replace. You may 
have to buy another book. I mean, there are tons of things that could happen to cause you more expense that was unplanned for in the months February through May, right? So it's, you know, Excel, um, ho I hope that I'm showing you that Excel is used as a planning tool and as a decision-making tool and that you can use some of these little features like the selections here where you can look at the sum for just certain cells, different things like that. Uh, as you are creating your spreadsheet. Okay, I'm going to go back over the some of these values now and just double check some of my entries and look at the formatting. So you might have noticed that when we didn't enter anything in a cell, your Excel might have shown a little hyphen there. Mine is just set up so that it just stays blank. Your Excel could have shown a zero there, and that's fine. I just have my display set up so that it's I like a real clean display, and it just shows nothing there if I have uh, no value entered. But it uh, the math is still correct in this. Okay, so I'm just going to go back and look at some of my totals that are done. And what I'm doing is just checking this against a spreadsheet I've, I've done before. And I'm going to go through kind of a troubleshooting scenario with you. For some reason, when I get to row 16, I'm going to question this value. And so I'm looking at, at row 16 for my gasoline expenses. Okay, and as I go back through this spreadsheet, since I have the formulas entered now, I can change any of these values, right? And the formulas are automatically going to recalculate. Let's take a look at this. We have a total of $600 that we're spending for gasoline for each of these months. But we know that in May and June, we plan a vacation because we're not gonna be in school in May and June. Maybe you're not going to summer school. So after you've looked at this, you've determined, well, I am gonna have a little money left over this year or this half year. I could do a vacation. So you could come back in and just click in, let's see, we said we would go in May and June. So I'm going to click in F16, and when I enter a new value, watch what happens to this 600 in the total column, and also watch happens what happens to the val all of these values. They're going to change. The expenses are going to change. The net's going to change, and the total over here for this half of a year is going to change. So click in cell F16 and put in 150. Maybe we're just taking a small trip. And we're not going to spend a lot, but we are going to have a little small trip. And it may extend over into June, so we're going to put 150 there in June as well. And our formulas uh, recalculate. Notice that now we are short a little bit more in May because we put in that we put in another $50 for gas. We did the same thing in June. However, in June we got another dividend on our income that we, we were able to cash out. And so that kind of sets us up for the following semester in school and for a small vacation in the summer. Of course, we would go back, depending on where we were gonna go, we would probably go back and you know change our miscellaneous and our food because we're gonna probably be eating out on that vacation and spending some money on you know probably extra entertainment. But once you have the spreadsheet built, you can go through here and click and change all of these values to show your little vacation coming up and plan, you know, how much money you want to spend on vacation, how much you want to have left at, you know, um, in July when your fall tuition comes due or in August whenever you're going to pay it. But you get the idea that Excel is used as a, as a planning tool and making financial decisions.
That is the same way that companies use their Excel spreadsheets. They use it for budgeting. They use it for projecting, which is what we did on this one. We projected our expenses. We projected our income. We came up with our net and we made a plan. And we, we know how, how we're going to have to manage our money for this period of January through June. So once you finish your spreadsheet, it, uh, it should end up with the values that I have here. You can pause the video and double check everything and make sure your values are right. Because the next thing we're going to do is go in and do some formatting on these numbers. And I'm going to share with you uh, the way that I like to see spreadsheets formatted. Uh, I have some, uh, there are some pretty standard ways that you, you would format a spreadsheet like this. Normally, we would want to come in and select A1 and, uh, and uh, A2, and we would want to bold our titles. So with everything in Excel, you select and then you apply the command. Um, maybe we would want to fill those in with a color. I'm going to choose a very light blue, but you choose whatever color you want. Just because I like to have that stand out. I would then want to... Um, I can leave my text the way it is, except that I do want my income and these titles. So you'll select A4 through H4 and apply a bold. And we also want to center that. So from the font group, we click on bold. From the alignment group, we'll click on center. So that those are now centered over, I think we had centered them before actually. It doesn't, it won't hurt it though to do it again. It won't uncenter it. Then we're going to select A9 through H9. And we're going to bold those because they're titles. And then we have our totals. And I like to set off the totals um, with, with some color. You don't have to do this, but I'm just going to show you how it's going to look. I'm going to select my... Uh, a7 through H7, and you choose what color you want, but that's money that came in to us, so um, I'm just going to go down here, and I'm going to choose a really light green because I want to be able to read it real well, and sometimes black on colors does not show up very well, but that shows us the total. Uh, this was the total expenses. Well, red and black doesn't work very well. Usually you show an expense in red. Red and black does not show up well together. So I'm going to go in and just choose another color to show my expenses. It's my spreadsheet, so I'm going to know that this means that this is an expense, right? So you can choose whatever color. We're really just doing this just to show you how to format the spreadsheet. So we're going to click OK on that. And then our net... Um, we could also highlight and give that another color. Give it any color you want. We're not really trying to follow any certain style here. We're just uh, practicing how we're going to format, uh, put the different colors on this. I'm going to use a yellow for that, but you use what you want. All right. Now it's beginning to look a little bit better, but one thing that we we really normally do, and this is a standard. These colors are not anything standard, obviously. These are not very businessy colors. This is a personal worksheet. But one thing we would do with our numbers for our totals is we would select our totals. So the first one we're going to do together, we're going to select B7. So select B7 through H7. And then look in the number group. You see these different formats that you can do for numbers. The accounting number format is going to put a dollar sign and it's going to put commas in. This would be for a percentage. This would be for a comma format. A comma style puts comma separators in the thousands place, but it doesn't put the dollar signs. Okay, so those are the different styles you have. 
for total, I do want the accounting number format. I like, excuse me, water again. Okay, so for that accounting format, we'll have our dollar signs, we've got our thousand separators, we've got our decimal points. So we're going to do that for all of our totals and for our net. So we'll go and we'll choose B18 through H18 and again come up to number and choose the accounting number format, which is the dollar sign. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll select B20 through H20. Again, we'll come up to the number group, select the dollar sign for the accounting format. And then we just click back outside of that. Now that looks fine, but we really can improve the different categories of our income, the wages and dividends. We can improve the categories of our expenses because some of these are in thousands and it's easier to read if we have that comma separator. So what I'm going to do is click an insertion point in B5. That's where our first category for expenses is. I'm going to go all the way through uh, G6 and I'm going to come up and make that a comma format. Now that makes it easier to read if you have the, the thousand separator. I'll do the same thing for the expense categories. I'll click an insertion point or a selection point, excuse me, in B10 and then I will click, hold, and drag across to, B, to G17 so that I can change that range of cells to the comma format. It's beginning to be easier and easier to read this. Now, one thing that I didn't do before is I didn't do this column H that has our totals for the whole year. So I could come over here and I could, of course, I want the accounting format on those totals. So I can just select those and then apply the accounting format to those. Most people prefer to have the accounting format on their totals, on their net, on their averages, whatever calculations they've done, and the comma format on the other values because if you put the accounting format on everything, it makes the spreadsheet very busy to have all those dollar signs on it. So that's pretty much the standard that you would use is that you would use a comma format for your data and an accounting format if you're dealing with financials, which is dollars and cents, you would use the accounting format on anything that had a formula. Of course, sometimes you're taking a percentage I mean, we could go in and find out what percentage of your income is your rent, what percentage of your income. We could, we could extend this to do a lot of different mathematical calculations, but I think we've done enough to get you introduced to Excel today and to introduce you on how to build a formula. In summary, anything in Excel, you click the cell that you want to change and then you format it or whatever, do whatever command you need. In summary, as far as formulas are concerned, the main thing you need to remember is that formulas always begin with an equal sign. Functions always begin with an equal sign. When you're planning a formula, the best thing to do is to look at your spreadsheet and just think in your just think about what you would do, what mathematical operations you would do if you were doing this on pen with pencil and paper. Once you have that kind of decided, then you're going to take not the values that you're calculating, but the cell addresses of the values so that once your spreadsheet is built, you can go in and play with it like we played with doing a vacation here and it automatically recalculates when you change your values. So those are the things that I would like for you to remember as you go into doing your first 
assignment for this class. Your first assignment is a budget, I believe, and so I will do a little introduction to it, but you will use the skills you learned in this demonstration to do your Excel next Excel assignment. Thank you, and I'll see you at the next video. Hello again. I'm going to use the demonstration Excel spreadsheet to show you a couple more things uh, that you need to know about Excel as you start to work. One of the things that I need to show you is what is going to happen if you enter numeric data in a cell that is not wide enough. To demonstrate this, I'm simply going to take some of our columns from our previous spreadsheet or worksheet. I'm going to make them a little bit narrower by dragging them in. You'll notice that when I did that, our data would not fit anymore. The symbol that Excel returns to you when your data will not fit, and this would only be your numeric data. This would be a formula, a function, or a uh, value. It's going to do these number signs. If that happens to you, the way to fix it is leave your data there. Don't have to redo your data. You know that this is just showing you that this is too narrow of a column. So you would come up to that column border, hit your double headed arrow, double click. H is too narrow. So I'm going to go up to the column, go to the border of that column, get my double headed arrow, double click. Okay, so that's one thing I needed to show you. The other thing I need to show you is how to look at your formulas. Now I did show you that you could click on a cell that has a formula and you could see the formula in the formula bar. But if you're trying to check your formulas, you don't want to have to look at them one at a time. So what I do to uh, look at formulas, because I like keyboard shortcuts, I hold down the control key and I type the tilde, which is to the left of the one. Look what happens when I do that. Control, and while I'm holding down control, tilde. What happens is that it shows the values of the data, but it shows actual formulas in the cells that have uh, formula formulas entered. So if I wanted to take that back to the what's called the values version of the spreadsheet, I do tilde, uh, control tilde. And this is the values version. Now, for those of you who like to use a mouse rather than the keyboard, here's how you could do that. We would probably be on our home tab after we finished this. And so if I wanted to show my formulas, I would go to the formulas tab and click and go all the way over here to the right, about two thirds of the way over the screen and find my show formulas. Click on that and again, it changes your spreadsheet to the formulas version or the formulas view of the spreadsheet. If I want to go back to the values version, I would click on show formulas again and it would take me back here. So those are some items that will be handy for you to know as you do the spreadsheets in this unit. The next video that or the next demonstration that I'm going to do is going to use a different spreadsheet. So I'm going to go ahead and save this spreadsheet by clicking on File and Save. Remember, we named it before. And I am finished with this spreadsheet, so I will close it. And then I'm going to go ahead and launch Excel again. I could have just clicked on File and then New, but I didn't. So we're starting with a new blank spreadsheet, and this is going to be very, very short. But I want to talk to you about um, formulas a little bit more. For this spreadsheet, and you do not have to do this one, you can just watch it, I'm going to put a title, uh, let me put it in all caps, demo of generic class average worksheet. There. Okay, so We've got just a generic class average. I am, this is going to be very, it's not going to be very creative at all. I'm going to put my labels in, assignments, um, tests, 
and the final exam. And then I'm going to put a place down here for my final class average. Okay. Uh, my assignment I'm not going to give very uh, creative names. I am going to stretch column A so that it fits everything. My assignments, names, I'm going to just name them up here on row three. These are going to be the assignment names. And they're just going to be one, two, assignment number one, number two. And we know that we can use the series fill here. If we want this to count by ones, if we want Excel to count by ones, we would select the pattern, which is one, two. Then we'd use our fill handle to take it on over to let it count to seven. So this, these are assignments one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so the, by assignment, we're going to enter our assignment grades and we're going to do an 85, uh, 77, a 70, an 88 on assignment 4, a 95 on assignment 5, 98 on 6, and a 100 on assignment 7. Over here, we're going to do our assignments average. I'm going to show you something on this. I'm going to type assignments. And what I want to do is I want to stack these titles. So I'm going to hold down Alt and press Enter. Alt enter and I'm going to put average. Okay, so what that did is it stacked, it stacked these titles. I typed assignments and then I held down Alt enter and then put in the word average. So I'm showing you a few more techniques on this spreadsheet. Okay, so then I'm going to go back and I'm going to fill in my tests. And my first test, let's say that I made a 95. The second test, I made an 88. And then right here, I need my test average if I'm going to label it right above where my test average is going to go. So I'm going to double click. I'm going to put test. I'm going to use Alt, Enter, and the word average. Now when I press Enter, it's going to make row six big enough, and it's going to st stack those that title for me. See how I did that? Okay, that's using that stacking of titles or stacking of labels is done with the Alt Enter key. Okay, so then we have our final exam. Let's say we made an 85 on that. And now we have everything except our formulas for this spreadsheet. One thing that I wanted to discuss with you is that Excel does use the same order of operations that you learned in algebra. I'm going to just key something in that we can use. I'm going to do 20 plus 25 times 2. All right, uh, it's not a formula. It's just a math problem. I'm right here in uh, C13 if you're watching what I'm doing. What is the answer to that math problem? Well, if we use the order of operations, we have to do the multiplication first, right? So that 2 times 25 would give us 50, and we would add the 20, giving us the answer of 70. Now, what if we forgot to use the order of operations, and we just added, we just did the problem from left to right? We'd have 20 plus 25, that'd give us 45 times 2, that would give us 90, right? Which would be wrong. So, you want to use the order of operations that you learned in algebra. Um, and I will put a link in the course for you so that you will have that. And we will uh, use the order of operations as we do our formulas in this particular spreadsheet. We will also use parentheses to show Excel which one, which form, which uh, part of the formula we want to have done first. So. Let's go back up to our assignment average. We're going to click in I5. And remember, we have a nifty little function that will do the average for us. So we're going to drop down our functions, choose average. We're going to check to make sure that Excel chose the correct things to be averaged, and it did. 
So we're going to press Enter. Notice that I have a very long decimal number here. Right up here in the number group, you can either decrease the number of decimals or you can increase the number of decimals. I'm going to decrease the number of decimals to one on this. Okay, so then we need our test average. Again, we can come up, use our average function, press enter, um, and we have that. And then we have our final exam. Okay, so if we wanted to uh, use this spreadsheet to figure out our final grade in the class, our final class average, we would have to know what percentage our assignments are, and we're just going to use 50% for that. We'd have to know what percentage our tests are, and let's use 25% for that, and then we'll have to know how much our final exam is worth, which is going to be worth the other 25%, right? Okay, so we're going to, we're ready to do our final class average. So all formulas start off with an equals, right? So we're going to key in an equal. And then we're going to have to decide on this how we're doing our formulas. Well, we know that we have to take 50% time our assignment average plus 25% times our test average plus 25% times our final exam, right? So what we're going to do is use parentheses to help tell Excel how we want this done because we want Excel to do a percentage of each average and then do the addition of those percentage points. So we're going to do an open parenthesis to start the formula, and then we're going to open a parenthesis to show the very first um, calculation. So if we want 50%, that's 0.50, isn't it, times, and our assignments average is in J5, no, excuse me, I5, excuse me, it's I5, I misread it, we would close that parenthesis. Then we want it to add the next math operation, which is open parentheses, 0.25, because it's 25%, right, times our test average, which is in D7, close parentheses, plus open parentheses, 0.25 for 25%, times our final exam, which is in B9, right? And then we would close that parentheses. Look how uh, Excel labels this for you so well. Notice that the inner uh, mathematical operations are surrounded by red parentheses. We have this one, we have this one, and we have this one. Well, we started off this, since we knew we were going to have multiple mathematical operations, we started off our formula with a parenthesis. So we need to end it with a parenthesis. And what color do you think it's going to be when we type it? Well, it's going to be black, isn't it? Because Excel uses color so well to help us read and proofread our formulas. And we could see that we needed, we had an open black parenthesis, we need the closed one. And what we were doing is we're enclosing in this formula the three different mathematical calculations so that Excel will know to do this first, then this, then this, and then it's going to go back and use the results of those to add them up. So when we press enter, of course, it's going to do it all for us and give us our final average of 87.2. 91, which most professors would round up to um, an 88. And so I'm just using the rounding the decimal point to take all the decimal points away and show you that Excel will automatically do that rounding. And it is set up so that if uh, 
you have a 0.5, it's going to round up to the next whole number. If you have 0.4 or below, it's going to round down to the, to the next lowest uh, whole number. So that's just to show you a little bit about the order of operations and how to use parentheses to tell Excel the order of the math that it should do in your formulas. Now, of course, if you want to do this spreadsheet to have as an example, you can uh, pause the video, put in all of the formulas, go back through it, and save it. But I didn't want the video to be really long, so I tried to go through it fairly quickly. I'm going to go ahead and do a file, save as, and as usual, save it on my desktop, and put class av AVG, class average, as my file name. So I'm going to save that, and that's going to end this video on Excel. Thank you.